Yeah, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Nice to see that someone is still here. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we are probably the two only insurance people here today. And uh, that's probably enough to make things boring. But uh, we'll actually be talking about new and exciting stuff for Latvia, which is uh, cyber insurance. And it's new in Latvia, but the company David works for uh, has been doing this type of insurance for 16, 17 years already. So in the world there are precedents and uh, I'm happy that this new product is now available also to Latvian companies and, and we'll now try to uh, tell you what's it for, how it works and uh, how it's vital part of cyber risk management. So yeah, in, in the beginning a bit of background and then a bit more about the risks and, and, and how insurance can help in uh, addressing those risks. So when, uh, when we think about cyber risks, there are probably many things we can think of, but one of, one of the primary concerns, of course, is data. Because the amount of data we have now, uh, it's quite a lot. And uh, there are some researchers that say that 90% of the data that we have now has been created just in the last two years. So by 2020, the amount of data the civilization will be created will increase by 50 times. And of course, where there's data, there's some risks. And data is very valuable to us in nowadays. Companies use it for research, for various stuff, and uh, like predicting weather and everything. And of course, where there's data, there's also data breaches. Here are, here are some examples of largest data breaches to now that are known to public. You might have heard also about uh, Yahoo's breach recently. That would be a big, big, big bubble here. And uh, yeah, if we talk about data, it's not just regular things like emails and passwords and addresses. For example, I know that David has a broken wrist and at some point it can be valuable. And uh, yes, so all sorts of data has some value. And uh, with value, there's of course an exposure. So for example, if uh, 200 billion emails are sent each day, it's so easy to send an email to wrong person, to wrong David or to wrong Loris. And there is, there is a chance that this email could have some confidential information in it. So what's the liability exposure there? Also, most of the people in Latvia are online. They are also having mobile phones. And it's pretty easy to drop a phone somewhere and then, yeah, what happens if the phone had some confidential information in it? And of course, uh, risks and uh, exposures come with research and development. If you gather some data, someone else might be interested in it as well. So yeah, now I'm passing on to David, who will speak more about actual risks. Is it working? Is it working? Hello? I'll just use this one, much easier. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so, as Luis was saying, um, the, the risks of exposure with the increased amount of data and our importance and reliance on systems is kind of increasing. And part of my job as an insurance broker in London is helping companies understand that that risk is, is insurable. Um, what comes to mind normally when I talk to companies, and I'm probably preaching to the wrong cry, choir here, um, is that cyber risk is, as hackers is external threats, and that's certainly what makes um, headlines in the media. Um, and as a result, that's what a lot of um, standard security systems are focused upon. 
But actually, when we look at the triggers for cyber losses and um, financial reputational loss as a, as in a result of a cyber event, um, actually only 41% of those are due to external malicious threats. Um, quite often, um, cyber um, security systems won't be able to pick up the vast majority of operational threats. Um, as Louise said, sending an email to the wrong person, very easy way of causing a huge data breach. Um, as, as is, if you think about how data used to be stored in filing cabinets, um, about 80 filing cabinets is equivalent to about a gigabyte of data. Um, now, if you think about how many gigabytes are on a mobile phone, about 64, that can be over 5,000 filing caps of data, very easy to lose. And the ramifications, as I'll explain later, under new legislation, that could be quite severe. Now, the costs to a company. If, if you were to have a data breach and you, and you weren't insured, these are the kind of costs you can expect to try and mitigate any financial and, and, and uh, reputational damage to your company. Legal costs for, um, for resolving um, the issue and handling any PR costs and, um, and mitigating any liability with clients can, up, can cost up to 300 euros an hour. Call centre costs, um, notification costs as well, which will become re are required under the new European legislation. Um, as you can see from the slide, it all amounts up and to, to the point where the average cost of a data breach privately is between 10 and 15,000 euros a day. Um, this is quite an interesting slide because it shows the average cost per item of data um, in accordance with different industries. Um, the average there is $169 um, per, per, per one item of data, so that's one individual's record. Um, now, if you think you have 100,000 records, or even just 1,000 records, that's good, that you're quickly encroaching on a large financial sum which can cripple companies of all sizes. Now, where does insurance fit in here? And rest assured, I know insurance perhaps isn't the most exciting topic to be talking about to most people. It means home and motor and property, but this is something which can really help alleviate the, the risks involved with cyber. It can be broadly put into th uh, to, to four separate, um, four separate uh, topics. The, the first is crisis and event management. This is if at a time of a data breach, all the costs um, and, and uh, involved um, in appointing, a, in appointing a, a, re a breach management consultant in a company. They will have everything from um, coming in, doing the forensic work, restoring data and systems and networks back to their original position, um, handling the notifications, whether that's by email or, or, or even just employing people to put stamps on paper. Um, or the fraud and extortion costs as well, and the consult consultation costs, um, as well as handling any PR crises, um, credit and identity theft, theft monitoring as well. The financial loss, and this is perhaps where uh, lots of, kind of commercial companies will, will see it. Let's imagine you're an online retailer and you rely on your, net, your, your website to, to sell stock. If that goes down for two days, that loss of business income, as well as the, the, the costs in working around that um, the, the short-term uh, solution, uh, can be insured under insurance. Um, extortion, I think you saw earlier on the program, there's something about the rise of ransomware. It's something we're seeing quite a lot as an insurance market. Um, also, all those costs involved with um, paying the extortion money and, uh, and uh, resolving all the issues associated with it can be covered. Um, something which, at the moment, isn't too heavy, but is coming under the new regulation is the liability. So there's an increasing moral and legal um, obligation for companies to look after the data of their customers. Um, the breach of privacy, breach of security, breach of intellectual property, all covered under the cyber insurance as well. Um, and as well as all the legal expenses associated with all, of the, all the things I've mentioned above. Now, one thing we quite often come across is this misconception about what cyber is and who requires cyber. Um, no longer is it anything just to do with technology or, or being online. The people who require cyber, requires, oh, cyber, I'll go back a bit. Um, anyone who has a presence online, anyone who relies on a network or a system, or anyone who um, holds sensitive information. I'm going to pass you back to Larisse quickly, who's going to explain why traditional insurance policies aren't quite enough. Yeah. Uh, the reality of uh, actual regular insurance policies are that 
most of them will likely to have some sort of exclusion regarding data or computer virus or whatever. So even if you think that you or your company is now well insured with property or liability insurance, it might well not be the case when it comes to cyber risks. So yeah. Um, so basically, um, this insurance uh, as David mentioned, is useful for many types of companies, uh, starting from lawyers, maybe to even churches, like in USA, because church holds some data on people, so of course they are exposed. Um, this is quite an interesting slide because it's from a very good website called Hackmageddon, and they pu they publish monthly results of, of data breaches worldwide. Um, a few. What's interesting about this, and I, I won't won't bore you to death um, later late in the day by going through one each one by one. But what you, is useful about this slide is it shows a, a, a full range of different types of industries and, and companies who have been affected by breaches, um, from hotels and restaurants to government entities to to, to, to people's Twitter feeds, all sorts. Now, who's it for? Um, lots of people will think because of what they've seen in the media about various online retailers and, and gaming networks that this kind, of, uh, this kind of insurance is only for large companies, but actually it, it's, it's quite the opposite. About, uh, about two-thirds of, of all attacks are targeted at SMEs, and when you bear in mind the financial and reputational damage that cyber events can have on small and medium-sized uh, entities, um, they're almost crippling. Um, perhaps these are... Um, worsened by the fact that uh, perhaps small companies don't have the infrastructure, don't have the investment to spend on the infrastructure and security in the first place. So insurance can be vital, really vital, in, in, in helping mitigate all those losses. Now who's it for again? Currently, um, the United States uh, is where 90% of the insurance policies for cyber are placed, purely because they have very strict legislation about uh, data breach notification. Um, as, I'll, as I'll go through in the next slide, actually, um, the legislation came coming into place uh, in 2018 is going to completely change the legal environment around data protection in Europe. Um, Lloyd's, for, for, you to, who, for those who don't know, is the um, is the, the big hub of insurance in, in London, and they recently published a study which, uh, out of 346 major European companies, uh, 92 had had a data breach in, in the last five years. So perhaps whilst we don't see day to day in, in the media uh, or hear things in newspapers about data breaches in, in Europe, especially um, compared to those in America, it, is, it really is a, a real risk and a real event that's happening. So there's GDPR, um, and I think you've, you've already had a, a couple of mentions of this today. Um, coming into force 25th of May 2018, um, and the important things for companies to bear in mind when it comes to insurance is that the 72-hour notification guidelines for a fundamental breach of a citizen's privacy um, is going to be required to, to your local data protection authority. And if that has been a fundamental um, risk uh, to, uh, and breach of their privacy, then it's going to have to be notified to customers as well. Um, I'd be confident in saying 9 out of 10 companies wouldn't be prepared if they had to notify customers tomorrow and wouldn't know how to do it. Um, what insurance can do is, is bring in people the same day to help manage the notification um, in both a legal and an operational perspective. Um, maximum fines as well. This is something which currently varies across Europe from about 5,000 to about half a million. It's, that's changing very quickly. It's going to be 4% of global annual turnover, um, up to 4% of global annual turnover, or 20 million euros, which are the highest. To put that in perspective, um, Talk Talker, a, a, UK, um, a UK network provider, and they, in 2015, had a large data breach of about 125,000 um, pieces of information, and they've just been fined 400,000 by, by the commissioner, information commissioner's office in the UK. But under the new GDPR, that could well have been over 70 million pounds. So the important thing about today is that, and quite often we sit in front of, of people uh, and, and, and uh, commercial entities and the IT managers, and they say, we don't need, we don't need cyber insurance, we've got, the, we've got the best cyber risk management um, protocols and procedures in place. And what we're not saying is insurance should replace any of that, but it should be used in, in um, partnership with it. So these are, these are the kind of risk management procedures uh, and things that companies are investing money in at the moment. 
your specialist software, your, with your antiviruses and your firewalls, your, hopefully your incident response planning, your, your um, disaster recovery plans and your business continuity plans, and all your procedures and processes, even to the point where um, you, you're assigning the responsibility of cybersecurity, hopefully to, to, to your CEOs or to your C-suite, rather than sitting in the IT manager's drawer. All these, all these risks can, um, and all these kind of procedures and costs and known costs, which can be budgeted for, kind of represented by that little pink bubble in the middle. Now, what's not covered by that is all the thing, are these things, the liabilities to your customers in the worst case scenario, or the financial loss, the business interruption, the extortion, the fines and penalties that can emerge, um, the crisis management, so day to day, um, the day to day handling of a case post a breach, um, and all the legal representation. All of these um, aren't budgeted for, obviously, within that initial cyber risk management. So simply, where, how does insurance fit in here? And hopefully this is an interesting way of trying to, to make it visually appealing. Quite, quite comfortably, insurance is a way of budgeting for, for these additional risks. Um, it, uh, it helps companies um, improve their cash flow rather than just having a, a big pot of money for, for a rainy day. Um, and the access to the, to the breach response companies who are experts who handle thousands of these cases every year means that the whole problem can be outsourced and handled very quickly. And the important thing here is that, um, contrary to, to quite a, to a lot of um, common belief, is that insurance policies are not that expensive for cyber, especially compared to the initial investment that you're already making on your security procedures. I know we're late in the day, so we can open up the floor to some questions if you have any. Thanks. Oh, we've got a couple. Yeah, I have a question about how would you go about like assessing a certain client? Like that would involve like assessing their current risk management as well, and you know sure. to 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 go about and tell them you know you you need you should have this sort of insurance fee, and how would you go about that and and actually evaluating because that would take a lot of time and. And, and you know, knowledge, knowledgeable people who would do that. Sure, sure. Good question. And um, much like other types of insurance, um, you'll be asked to fill out a, a questionnaire, basically a proposal form, which will ask you questions every, or line, along the line from um, you, your exposure, firstly, um, in terms of revenue, in terms of number of clients, in terms of data you hold, data you process, and that kind of thing. But it'll also ask you risk management questions. I mean, it's very rare that you're going to be able to even buy cyber insurance if you don't have that fundamental risk management because it should be a partnership rather than an, an alternative. So, th th so, I mean, first step is getting in touch with a local insurance broker um, who can start the ball rolling and with a proposal form. But what would you say how, how much, you know, that would take a while, wouldn't it? Like, Surprisingly not. Um, no, not anymore. Um, what perhaps can take a while is um, a, little, a, little, a little bit longer. It's not like sometimes here you can buy um, your car insurance just from, from typing in a number plate. Um, these cyber insurance policies are bespoke to companies to make sure that what is co um, what's the coverage, coverage being offered aligns perfectly with your risk, risk exposure. Yeah, I have a a similar sort of question now, and let's say that there is a cyber insurance policy and it's apparently being issued and you have assured that we have certain security controls in place. And, and now when, let's say, some accident happens, so what's next? Does the client have to demonstrate that those security controls were working all the time? So how do you handle that? Um, sure. Well, the, the good thing about the cyber insurance is that in partnership with breach, breach response companies, there's literally a phone number, and that will say, if you have a breach, call them, and they'll come in straight away to, to start handling the problem. If you think about it from an insurer's perspective, from the time of breach, the longer that, that time goes on, the more it's going to cost the insurer money. So they're very keen on getting people in straight away. Is that what, what, what you meant? Uh, I meant rather about this uh, payout from the insurance companies of yep. based, basically what are those conditions? Um, what do you have to demonstrate to 
get reimbursed. It's not overly rigorous, if I'm, if I'm completely honest. Um, what you obviously present in your proposal form will give them a decent informa um, information about what your material risk is. Um, and so, as long as there aren't too, ma too massive dissimilarities of what's on there and what, um, and what the insurer thinks the risk is, then it shouldn't be an issue. But if you're talking about exclusions, what kind of standard exclusions come under a cyber policy, um, then it, first of all, it's, it's pretty bespoke. And so, changing different industries can change the exclusions. But you know, the one common exclusion which really comes to mind is can any um, bodily injury or property damage as a result of a cyber extortion event or cyber event. Yeah, and then my second question would be that, okay, you explained how this applies to data breaches mostly, but let's take the case which was recently in Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. The central bank got robbed some 80 plus million yeah, dollars. So would that be a valid case for cyber insurance? And how much would they get back from insurance company in that situation? I don't, I'm not overly aware of the, the scenario. What, what, what was the cause of the loss? Oh, Earlier this year, uh, some, some un, yet unknown criminals stole uh, 80 or 86 million dollars from Central Bank of Bangladesh through Swift Network. Yeah. So financial institution cyber is something which is which is, is covered, um, but it has to be quite a specialist policy to, to include the, the crime aspect of it as well. Um, what insurance, what this type of insurance policy and, and the, the, the bare bones of the insurance policy will look to do is kind of look after your first party costs and getting your system back together. Um, but there are instances in the, in the London insurance market, and this is why it's perhaps a benefit to come to London for it, where we can combine those um, crime aspects of cover under the cyber as well. Okay. Anyone else? If not, I think what we can what we can lastly do is just uh, one more interesting website. There is a website called the North Side Map, which I hope you've seen. Um, this helps kind of. Uh, visualize what, what, what we're kind of seeing day to day and whilst this isn't picking up everything and it looks like America's being bombarded it's just quite an interesting representation of what um, modern day risks look like. I um, hope you've had a good day.